Hi guys and welcome again to another Champion Bets webinar. Uh, tonight's webinar is a topic look deeper, how to find winners at big odds. And with me tonight is our Dean's Winners Analyst and Expert Dean. Dean, how are you? I'm very well, thanks mate. How are you going? All right, well, thanks everyone for uh, joining. Um, I'm going to, you know, try not to take up too much of your time. Uh, try and see if we can race through things in about half an hour. Uh, really, the purpose is just to give you some insight. Uh, the two topics I thought I'd focus on today is identifying big price winners. So we've had, you know, a few uh, hundred to one winners um, with the service, uh, you know, over the past um, few years, and 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 you know, lots of uh, seventy to one, sixty to one, fifty to one winners. So I thought I'd just go step through some of my thought process, um, show a little bit on, on my database as well, but um, you know, just go through the thought process and in terms of identifying really big price winners, um, and then a few other form analysis techniques on, you know, not huge price winners, but just other techniques that uh, you know form form analysts and students can sort of use to um, to get an edge above the the standard sort of form analysis that most do. Just a little bit about me. Um, my name's Dean. I've got I've got two horse racing tip services that I've been running now for uh, for six years. Uh, Dean's winners in, in Trial Spy, uh, both both to limited members. Um, I've done a number of sort of radio appearances, webinars, and, and podcasts on on racing and, and betting. Um, and combined, these services delivered over 1,300 units profit on on 100 unit banks, um, around 9% POT, uh, and that's with uh, over 25,000 advised bets now over over the years. Um, just to summarize what I do, I, I use um, uh, analysis of a horse racing database uh, called Ratings to Win. Um, and uh, you know, I think I have a unique approach to, to form analysis to try to identify selections that the bookmakers or the market have significantly mispriced. Uh, um, you know, for, for myself and members to take advantage of. Um, you know, I do a lot of video review, uh, take a real good deep look at historical trends and statistics um, of races, um, analyze sectionals and, and speed ratings that aren't available to the public, um, and use a, a, a concept I, I've called isolation. I'll explain a bit further to sort of make sure I'm assessing the correct variables in the correct situations. Um, so then sort of, you know, establish a, a rated price for a runner and, and use, uh, you know, money management and staking strategies to ensure a long-term profit. Um, ultimately, my aim is really just to educate members on how to bet successfully and profitably uh, with their punting and and, and understand how, how professionals operate and think and win by taking a, a long-term perspective and treating their betting as an investment. So sort of summarising, you know, selections are identified through speed and class figures, uh, use of accurate speed ratings against pars uh, and separate class assessments um, that enables you to make accurate comparisons of runners from different tracks and distances and states and classes. Um, try to identify the opportunities um, through the use of certain criteria that I'll explain on, on this webinar that the bookies and markets sort of undervalue the most. Um, you've also got to determine where, you know, the speed or other ratings might be incorrect or ineffective or unreliable. Um, and I guess this concept called isolation, I'll give some examples as we go through the webinar, but it's sort of just what I what I call when you need to determine with each race what's the most important uh, factor within the race. You know, the class of race, you know, the class of the horse is often really important, certainly uh, across all races, but, um, you know, the, the greater in class that you go, uh, you know, whether it's metro versus provincial versus country, uh, you know, track conditions, um, as an example, if, if you're racing on a real bog heavy 10 um, track, then, you know, I have the belief that, you know, you can focus and tailor your form analysis around the wet tracks and, and ignore a lot of the other factors or give the weighting to all the other sort of form factors a lot less than that, for example. Same sort of course distance specialists in particular, and again, on certain tracks where the, where the speed map is vitally important, uh, you know, such as a tight turning track where you really, really want to be on, on pace. Uh, and a comment that we're making a lot through this webinar is look deeper and that's sort of how I've summarised uh, what most people need to do. If you really want to find those big price winners, they're not going to uh, just jump out at you on the page. You need to look deeper. And, and what I've done with some of these examples is sort of show how I think most punters and bookies would have assessed a horse and why it came up such a big price and then what my thought process was to identify that winner. And hopefully that helps you just with your general thinking when you're, when you're trying to identify uh, big price winners if you're on your own. These are just a few examples of the big price wins. We've backed Khan uh, at 150 to 1. MD, who was $101. This is sort of the officially recorded prices. It did actually get out to an amazing 
$560 on Betfair at uh, one point. So they get Betfair SP at $260. Sacred Falls winning a Doncaster at $51. Uh, a few others there at $41, $34. Um, and when there were a couple of tips in the race, we had Stage Girl at $126 at Pinjara, Kaiser France, $71 at Eagle Farm, uh, and a whole host of other sort of 50 to 1, 40 to 1 winners there. Um, I'll go through some examples of those now. Khan was the first one. Uh, it was 201 actually when when advised. It was running an Eagle Farm 2200 meter Saturday, uh, BM75. Uh, yeah, what you see in the sort of summary of the form, its last five runs, uh, it had been beaten out of sight in all five of those runs. Uh, a couple of them over unsuitable distances, but you know you wouldn't have anyone saying it was in peak form. Um, certainly from this uh, from this preparation. I guess when most people were looking at some of the key factors that they'd look at here, class, distance, course going, your class has beaten nine and a half lengths in its last two runs in lower grade. It never won at the distance. Uh, the course had 11 starts for one win, uh, but average beaten margin 8.9 lengths in the course. The going at had seven starts for two wins. The trainer was a you know very little known trainer from Oki. The jockey was a little known inexperienced female apprentice. Uh, and its best run on its last five starts was running fifth or seventh beat in six lengths. Um, you know, odds 201 and no chance. So, you know, the reason why the horse was 201 is this is the sort of analysis that most punters and bookies would have done. If you look a little bit deeper, it had actually won two Saturday Metropolitan Class 6 staying events uh, previously in its career. It had won those events over 1,800 and 2,100 metres. So the class and distance weren't an issue. It had won at the track. Um, and then going, it had one on good three all the way through to heavy 10, so a slow six was not going to be of any issue. It had the same trainer throughout its career, so you could assess it based on its past. Um, and the same jockey had also won on him at Doombin, so although it was a less known female jockey, uh, she had won on him previously. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the horse ran well for uh, the jockey, obviously, and that was really of no issue. It had similar form lines to its previous two Metropolitan Saturday victories. And importantly, it was expected to lead in a race with below average speed. Um, in terms of the odds, well, the last two times the horse had won on a Saturday, uh, it was at odds of $99.60 best tote or $270 on Betfair and $148 best tote on $220 on Betfair. So it wasn't as though the stable or anyone actually backed it when it won. Um, you know, it had a tendency to uh, get their cricket score odds. Um, and just, uh, you know, if I show you my database and that runner really quickly, um, you can see a little known trainer and, and, and jockey. Um, but, you know, it was the three kilo uh, claim. It was, it was down on the weights. Um, it was going to lead on uh, what was expected to be a, a BA here, which means a, a below average pace. Um, so, you know, this, this helps to assess where the horse is going to sit. Um, and it was going to sit, you know, in, in front on a below average pace and have everything chasing it. I uh, did two runs from the spell uh, for sixth and ninth, which, you know, for a stayer um, isn't too bad. Um, and this is the run here uh, where it won um, at Eagle Farm uh, at 80 to 1. And you can see that previously it had won at 60 to 1 at Doombin only last prep uh, and previously at Eagle Farm also the same class at 60 to 1. Uh, SP. So, you know, that's uh, just an example of um, what I look for with that runner. And, you know, if you're looking deep enough through a horse's form, you know, often when, when a horse is 201, uh, sometimes you can ask why not. And certainly this horse ticked a lot of boxes. Another example was Stage Girl at, at Pinjara in a maiden, uh, 1400 metre race. Uh, you know, its last three runs it had been beaten 11 lengths, 8.8 lengths, and 5.5 lengths. And had six starts for no wins and no placings. Um, and it was uh, as much as 151 um, when I sent the advice out. I did have the third highest peak distance rating um, on the ratings to win database. Uh, it had a positive trainer change, which is something that's very important that I look for. And certainly, um, you know, when you're looking at big price winners, a, a trainer change is uh, a real opportunity to, to see um whether a horse can improve, and, and, and often that will be at the first run for the new trainer, um, or the first or second run. But you know, horses really do, uh, if they've shown ability in the past, they really do appreciate sometimes going into a different environment. Normally, you want that trainer change to be positive in terms of the trainer's results, but um, 
you know, sometimes uh, horses also appreciate just going from a, a city environment where they're boxed up in stables into a, uh, a beach sort of environment or a country environment also. So uh, it, it's really something to, to look for. A trainer at Excellent Stats on the track, uh, there was a, um, a gear change uh, and it was on pace, so with a good draw and a race with below average speed again, which were all big positives at Pinjara. Um, and it did have a very high speed um, and class rating on fifth at Ascot. So, uh, again, it was a horse that in, in a weak maiden was a really, really crazy price. And once you had to look at um, a look at it deeper, deeper in, uh, you could see that, uh, you know, it was well unders. And, and that was also identified in the final SP of $25. Um, that showed that early market was was very wrong. Uh, another horse is uh, MAD. It was uh, 101. Um, when I advised members to back it, um, you know, it traded between 430 to 1 and 560 to 1 in the last five minutes, which was uh, quite incredible. And their best fair SP was uh, $260. It was on a Toowoomba maiden. Uh, and again, you can see that the form, sort of in its last three runs, beating 15 lengths, 12.4 lengths and 7.5 lengths, um, wasn't, uh, wasn't the ideal sort of form lines you want going into a race. What you will notice, though, is... It was six of eight beaten only four lengths in a Toowoomba mile in class one grade, which was uh, up in grade, and seventh or 11 beaten 2.8 lengths in a Toowoomba mile maiden, uh, where it wasn't beaten far. It was very, very unlucky in that race. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of being a sort of course distance specialist, it certainly was evident in its form that uh, that was the, the track and distance where it was most uh, uh, most suited. So again, most punters and bookies are looking, and it's been been 35 lengths combined its last three starts. Never won a place at the distance. Never won a place at the course. Never won a place on a good track or from a fair few attempts. Again, a little known trainer with a poor record, and a little known jockey with a poor record. Um, and at 12 starts, its best result had been a fifth, and it was 101 in early markets. Again, what I was looking for in terms of class, it had actually only been beaten 4.9 lengths in a Saturday Metro two-year-old race. Um, it was very unluckily beaten um, and beaten 2.8 lengths in the same class when, uh, you know, it could have won the race. Um, and it was just blocked blocked for running for, for most of the straight. And, and you know, and watching the video replays is where the video work can be important. But, you know, it could have easily won that maiden that day. And it was only beaten four lengths in the C1. It had the third highest peak distance rating in the, in the race and only one length from the top horse. It had the highest individual speed performances. First and third highest track distance speed rating it had Two good performances at the distance. It definitely appeared to run its best races on the home track at Toowoomba. Um, it led the same trainer throughout the career, and that was on it racing at its home track. Uh, it was the same jockey that rode it when it, it probably could have won or should have won uh, at the previous um, the previous maiden run. Uh, its last two runs of the course distance were good. Um, and interestingly, you know, when you're looking at sort of SP profiling, it, it was backed into eleven dollars in C1 company. Uh, at, it, at its, uh, you know, in a recent start, and it was now 101 plus in a maiden. So, you know, the price, the price was pretty crazy. Um, you know, if we have a look, um, I'll just try to get this one up um, on the database. Are there any questions just while I uh, try to get this up? Won't be long. None so far, mate. Nope. All good. Oh, well. They're listening attentively. All right. I'll have it up in a second. So, again, this is the horse, um, Emma D. And I sort of draw your attention here um, to its general form. And you can see this was its first start right down the bottom. And you sort of work your way up. Um, yeah, the first thing you'll see is it actually ran at Doombin in a Saturday Metro race and was only beaten 4.9 lengths and was galloped on. So from a class perspective, it, it wasn't hopeless. These are sort of the runs that, that also caught my attention. Um, Toowoomba Maiden over 16.25, beaten three lengths, and Toowoomba 16.25 meter C1 beaten uh, four lengths. Um, they were kind of the two runs that were of real interest to me because it was coming back to that Toowoomba 1625 and its ratings in those runs were well above anything it had done at any other track. So it just looked like its home track and the mile was sort of perfect for it. 
Um, can you hear this okay? Yeah, perfect. So I think MD, MD is the um, horse in the uh, orange from memory. Um, So you can see it there. I'll try to make it bigger here. They might help. It's here in the orange, and it can't can't get through at the moment. Back on the rails, uh, about sort of eighth. You can see it here, trying to get through, trying to get through, can't get through. Just about just tries to go in and then has to come dark back in. Never gets clear running. It gets squeezed out again here, and ends up finishing. You know, only three lengths from them. But that's where, you know, you can sort of see on on review of that run that had it got clear running, it it could have very easily won that race and I think probably would have. Uh, and backed that up with a an even higher rating run when backed into eleven dollars and a C one. So, you know, the the notion that that horse was to start uh, you know, five hundred and sixty dollars uh, one point on Betfair and start two hundred and sixty one was absolutely crazy. But again, it takes looking deeper in the form to identify those sorts of horses. Time and truth was an interesting one. The official price we recorded for that one was twenty three dollars. It actually got up to one hundred and forty to one on Betfair and eighty dollars on Betfair SP. Again, it's an example of people missing a horse. Really, it had run it was running in a Bunbury thousand meter fifteen k maiden. He run fourth, beaten only 1.5 lengths in a Saturday Metro 60k race. Uh, it had the second highest individual speed rating in the database. It was only 0.5 lengths from the top rater. It was also 5.5 lengths above the third highest. So uh, it had outstanding speed ratings. Um, there were only five instances of 75 plus ratings uh, in the race in their career. And the next highest was 69. And the horse had two of those five highest 75 plus ratings. So it just rated really, really well. Um, and, and twenty three dollars seemed a nice price. Um, and those who I, you know, I always recommend, you know, who, who split it um, and 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 took something on Betfair uh, or half on Betfair, you know, did did exceptionally well, um, as is quite often the case. Fishbone Spry was another example too, you know, running in a Strathalbyn Mile maiden race. Again, another example of a horse who, you know, on, on form, basic form, looks like it's been beaten. Uh, a fair way and isn't going particularly well but it did run good efforts for fifth in its first starts and that was in the stronger grade that was actually in melbourne grade and it was coming back to uh to adelaide it was favorite at its second start in stronger grade so they obviously thought the horse had some ability its first run at morphville actually rated well the trainer had very, very good stats it was a positive rider change to dominic tenor who's a very good rider um it was dropping you know from morphville metro to strathalbyn at the third highest speed rating the fourth highest uh, peak distance rating and the trainer jockey combo which is something i look at um, had excellent stats uh, and strike rate. And, and this is something that I look at, and, you know, again, this horse SP'd at $60, got out to $90 at some point. I'll just show you quickly. Um, up here on what I look at in terms of the trainer jockey stats and how I sort of set up um, set up my view to, to look at that. I can click on the trainer, for example, and I've built these strings where I can see the trainer's overall record, and you see it's very, very rare for a trainer to have a positive POT. Um, you can see his record in maiden races and other races, metro, provincial, country, the bets, wins, the strike rate, the, the POT, how they go at the track, um, and he had a very good record at the Strathalbyn track, and also the trainer-jockey combo, so I can look here. Um, for Dan Shepard with Dominic Tanua. Together they've had 34 races for seven winners, a 20% strike rate and a 96% POT. So a really good combination um, and everything else sort of stacked up, uh, you know, a below average speed, going to sit on pace um, on the speed map, which is auto-generated based on um, the, the early sectional times that the horses have run. Um, and so all of that, again, 
you know, you sort of you put it all together and it's quite crazy how horses can start these sort of prices um, when you look deep enough to, to identify them. Just two Vs was a really interesting one at Hawkesbury. Um, I find Hawkesbury to be a real horses for courses track. Uh, it was advised at $40. Um, uh, Beth Ferris P was $55 around the Hawkesbury 1800 metre maiden. Um, the fourth highest peak distance rating, the second highest speed rating in the race. Uh, the trainer does get winners up at big prices. Um, and its last start run was, was really good. And it, it seemed to be peaking at the right time. Um, if I just have a quick look at that one here, and I'll show you how I sort of look at the uh, specific stats around the um, track and distance. Uh, so again, you know, just having a look at the, the trainer, um, his eight percent strike rate, but he does seem to get winners at big prices. You can see sort of uh, uh, $27 there, two winners at Hawkesbury, an average price of $24. So, um, you know, I often do look just to see if a trainer gets horses up at big prices, then they'll often do it again. It often means that just the market underrates the trainer and the trainer, and so connections probably don't bet. Um, which does mean you're getting better value in the long run. Um, so one thing I, I do is use this uh, compare previous encounters and one technique of use certain tracks when I believe that they're real um, horses for courses track is just you can click on same track and actually see uh, the records of all horses at that particular track. Um, and what you'll see here is the speed rating um, of just two Vs and it's one run at Hawkesbury where it, it ran second um, over a mile and you know sat sort of 10th charge time for second beaten 0.8 lengths by Cam Badge who actually turned out to be a, a, a handy mare and you can look at the stats of uh, the horses so you know can have a look and see it was beaten by Cam Badge who as you can see turned out to run in, in group races and that sort of thing and uh, you know was a handy horse um, but it, its speed rating at Hawkesbury there was a 95, um, and that was well above what anything else had done at Hawkesbury. And, and again, uh, you know, I used the term isolation. Um, that was a real, really good example of, of isolation where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to look at it. Um, its record at Hawkesbury and specifically, uh, and noting that that still was the second highest speed rating overall. But, you know, when I'm looking at Hawkesbury, the Hawkesbury form is something that I take into uh, deep consideration because I just find certain horses perform well there and often the favoured runners just don't handle that track which is quite different um, uh, to a lot of the, the other tracks. Chesley Lee was actually similar and it was another big price one at Hawkesbury for a similar reason. Uh, so the official price was $56. It did bet for SP at $104. Uh, it was running in a Hawkesbury 1400 um, meter group three race. Um, it ran seventh beaten um, 5.4 lengths uh, in the Randwick Provincial Championships. Um, his last two starts over the Hawkesbury 1400 run second, beating a nose to a black type performer and won by 1.8 lengths in the Provincial Championships qualifier, which um, were both good standards. It had the second highest speed rating on the track and the top two speed ratings for the track and distance. As I say here, Hawkesbury are real horses for courses track. And so again, um, you know, I can have a quick look here. Um, just a quick one Dean while you're yeah. um, finding that I've got a question from Shane one of our great clients uh, he says just a quick one if you can find them at big odds surely there's also plenty in the lower double figure or even single figure range as well that are big overs yeah no absolutely um, it's more just that the, the, the webinar topic was mainly on big price winners, but I've actually got a few examples down here. Uh, so you've skipped ahead of me that I will show you <laughs> of winners more at that $17, $8, 9 $2.80, $10 price and just the different reasons why. So uh, he's jumping the mark, Shane. Um, but I am going to cover some of those too. So um, so I'll just, I'll just show you here, Hawkesbury. Um, and again, you know, with Hawkesbury, I like to just race straight to the record on the track and, and, and see the opportunity there because um, uh, because the real horses, the course is track. Um, and if you have a look here, you can see Shazzy Lee um, 
had a 101, which was the equal top rating and well above the rest. Um, and you know that was a good race. It also uh, ran second here in a class one, and and that might not um, you know, be a great form for for the class of the race. Um, but you can again look a bit deeper and, and find that it was uh, beaten by a handy type of type that sort of um, was a, a black type performer, and uh, um, it, it was obviously a horse that, that did appreciate the Hawkesbury track. And um, you know you can you can sort of dive into to the form of horses and just see how they've gone in the past. And sometimes you'll identify uh, situations where, um, you know, they might be going ordinary, but suddenly they'll, they'll peak up at a, at a certain track and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I just thought that was a, a really big price. And, you know, there's a lot of assessment, obviously, of the other runners um, and, and, and finding the negatives of them. Um, in this particular race, it was a FS, which is a fast speed. And the horse is a back marker. Um, back markers have absolutely no issue at Hawkesbury. In fact, it's probably one of the rare, rare you know, New South Wales tracks where back markers are probably favoured of anything, um, and particularly when there's a fast speed. So it had a green there, which sort of means it's actually going to be suited on the speed. Um, and that turned to be the case. There are a lot of, a lot of pointers there that, that suggested it, um, it was going to be well overs, and, and again, it was. Kaiser France was another... Um, uh, Eagle Farm 2200 meter group three race on a heavy eight. Uh, Eagle Farm, you know, the track's being rebuilt now, but it just was an absolute swamp at the time. The track was terrible and it was very heavy, wet testing conditions. You run third, beaten only half a length in, on the track, on the heavy, uh, in a recent start. And for me, a horse, the track was throwing up crazy, crazy results um, for a number of weeks. And it was surprising me how many people were, you know, looking at all the other form factors. When it actually appeared that the most important form factor was really can it handle that Eagle Farm slop? That you know, there were even uh, a couple of New Zealand trainers who were quoted that you know it, it was like a heavy heavy 18 even from New Zealand standards. Um, so it was really wet. So yeah, this is again where I talk about isolation. Where for me on that meeting the only thing I looked at was the horse's stats on heavy, and the thing that I absolutely promoted more than anything else was heavy at Eagle Farm because that was some sort of crazy level of heavy that wasn't even, uh, you know, on the scale of heavy tracks in most places. So the fact that it run well on the heavy at that track previously, I gave more prominence than virtually any other form factor. Um, uh, and the two horses that beat it in that particular race, it was only beaten half lengths, which when you're talking about a staying race on a heavy track, is, is, is nothing really. They were much shorter in the market. So this was the real value horse at $71 and Betfair at SP $130. Um, and incredibly actually had the equal top uh, course distance speed rating for that race. All right. So um, I'll go through a few more at uh, um, more regular odds, I suppose. Uh, and, and just go go through these quickly. Full revs, uh, and, and also the the, uh, the sort of isolation or, or the reason I, I focus on these horses. Full revs is one uh, I'll go through first here. It was running at uh, Mudgy, I believe. And one of the interesting things that I noticed about this horse, uh, and it was $17 in this race, um, was actually working through its, its detailed form. Was, and you can sort of, you can glance sometimes at these speed ratings here. But what, what I noticed was that its speed rating, when it was ridden by, um, Alan Chow and its performance was substantially better than with any other jockey. See Alan Chow here, he's run third, next time he's won, next time he's run a very close fourth, next time he's run third, uh, close second. And interestingly though, when ridden by other jockeys, beaten 3.7 lengths, beaten 10 lengths, five lengths, uh, beaten four lengths, um, you know, there was sort of quite a noticeable increase too in its highest ratings, 93 there um, and 89 there. And 95 there, and 91. The only times it had rated 90 plus was when Alan Chow was riding. Uh, and and you can see here, Yuya Saiki, Eleanor Webster Horse, Mitchell Bell, all ridden it, had done nothing um, in, in three starts. Um, again, it, it looked suited um, from a number of uh, parameters, but uh, you know, another one was just 
isolating, uh, you know, for example, his distance record. So just focusing on horses at the mile, and you can see it had the two high speed ratings for all horses at the mile, and in fact had five of the top seven speed ratings for horses at, at the distance. Um, so again, you know, when you when you look at things like that, you try to isolate what you consider important. Seventeen dollars was a really big price. Tambro's game was a, a sort of tracked distance specialist. Um, And again, I can I can look at um, the previous encounters here, narrow down to the track and distance. And important with Devonport, you know, the reason why track distance is so important, Devonport's actually a synthetic track, and it's the only one in uh, Tasmania that is. So when I'm looking at form of that, I'm far more interested in, its, in the track distance type stats than anything else. You can see Tambro's game actually had the top five speed ratings uh, of all horses over that track distance. So a lot of people are backing horses that are running well on the grass. We focused on this horse at eight bucks. It was a clear best horse uh, over the track and distance. Uh, it did the job. Generous Albert was the same. Um, uh, and, and with the time, I'll just I'll skip over that one, but it was the same deal. It was a track distance specialist. It had great ratings compared to everything else uh, over the, the Northern Mile. And again, it was $9. That's just if I had, is a, a, just a pure speed um, example. Um, and I, I showed it because it's 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 a real obvious one, um, and it's quite easy to kind of demonstrate that the power of of speed ratings and how they can help you. Um, and the simple way was that uh, all horses uh, had only had one start. His speed rating was 71 um, over the exact same track and distance uh, compared to. Um, the second horse who rated a 65. That's six points different, which equates to about three lengths different. So this horse had three lengths to make up. Um, we backed Just Justified, and I guess what was interesting about it was that's Justified, uh, you know, best tote was $2.80. Well, sorry, Am Razor, yeah, you know, was uh, the hot favorite, um, and yet had three lengths to make up um, on that's Justified in a straight comparison of one start, same track, same distance, same trainer, same jockey, uh, everything is the same weight, everything was exactly the same, yet the market preferred this one, uh, and yet this one had the speed ratings above. So for some reason the market believed that that race was stronger, but the speed rate is suggested otherwise, uh, and that's the benefit of using those ratings. Dean. Yes. I've got a question. I've got a question from Daniel, uh, another great client of ours. Uh, he says, howdy, Daniel and Dean. It's been great showing the official tote bet fair SP on all these results. What do the bets generally recommend? A mixture of bet fair, top tote, fixed and bob on weekends? Uh, yeah, so um, I might segue quickly to the members info pack, which uh, all members receive. Um, it's got a lot of detail, you know, frequently asked questions, uh, setting yourself up to win, um, you know, but on how, what time the selections are sent. A whole lot of detail you can see here, good sort of seven, eight pages on getting the best possible odds, um, you know, the power of Betfair um, and other things like running betting banks and avoiding getting ba banned by the bookies and, and the avoidance of variance and perspective um, and, and the minimum bet laws and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of information there. The general summary is that yes, um, most bets are recommended essentially at, at uh, you know half half the fixed price, best fixed price available, um, and at half uh, you know Betfair SP or BOB. Um, and you know the great thing is that there's there's a few uh, sort of bookmakers now taking on the corporates. Um, so there's, there's there's quite a few corporates now who bet best of the best, which is best total top fluck. Um, the highest of best of top flux uh, on Saturdays. There's actually a, a, a bookie called Vic Bet Rod Cleary who's doing it for all races, uh, provincial, country, every day. Uh, there's another guy, David Dwyer, I've noticed, is starting to do it um, in Sydney uh, on all sort of um, all days. Uh, so there's a few opportunities there to bet BOB uh, everywhere. Uh, Betfair SP, you know, my, my general suggestion usually is, is is best total BOB are better for horses at ten dollars or under, or some nine dollars or under. If they're double figures or more, you generally find Betfair SP over the long haul is going to be better. Now, of course, 
you know, I know a lot of people work full time or whatever, but, um, you know, even just on the weekends, I always advise people as much as possible do do monitor because one thing you'll notice in the presentation is uh, the Betfair SP price can be enormous, but the actual the actual best price on Betfair um, can be substantial. Uh, if you want to get advanced, there are, you know, I have had a member, for example, who built a bot to, to back the selections and just on Betfair alone. Uh, and he um, would tell me gleefully about, you know how how enormously substantially higher than the official results he was getting, uh, and he wasn't even having to sit and place any bets. So there's you know if you go to the Betfair hub and learn more about APIs and stuff, you can set that up too. So, uh, but yeah, generally it's it's sort of half fixed um, and, and half betting late uh, is the general suggestion. Um, and, and sometimes I will put an F for a firmer or a D for a drifter if I think. Um, the market's going to move one way or another, uh, and I do also suggest you know BOB or Best Toad SP if there's a horse where I just think it's going to drift, so there's no need to take anything early. Beautiful, and I have read that member's uh, info pack yesterday, and it is very comprehensive and full of information. So everyone will get that once they uh, subscribe to the service. I've got another question here from Sam. Great insights, Dean. Thank you. Does the service have a lower strike rate because of these big prices? Does your staking management smooth out variance in results? Uh, does it have a highest, uh, lower strike rate than other services? Uh, probably, yes. Um, uh, you know, there, there's some services that back predominantly favourites. So um, on a strike rate, they're going to have a strike, higher strike rate. Um, you know, managing variance is something that I try to do, and obviously the staking is is done in a way to uh, attempt to do that. Um, I w wasn't happy with the variance, um, uh, and so a few m months ago, I, I spent four months actually, and I, I stopped the service, and I just sort of recalibrated. Uh, it's something that I've done across both services, members will know, for, for six years. And I think that's why we've achieved the results we do, because I do take the time to sort of step away, uh, readjust the thinking, go through all the past results, um, you know, uh, have a look at the database and, and make the various adjustments uh, and, and just sort of fix things up. Uh, trials by members will know that we actually started uh, the year off, um, you know, behind par and, and making a bit of a loss. Um, and then I, I tweaked a few things and, you know, from, from June to now in the last few months, we're up 120 units. Um, so it's coming back from the break on teams. Since the first couple of months, I think we're up about 30 units. I'm hoping we can do the same as Trial Spire over the next few months and, you know, kick up to 120 units in a short period of time as well. Um, but that's certainly the aim. Uh, you know, I'll give you an idea of the, the staking. Um, these were the bets that were sent out. I think some members did join today. So this was sort of the, the first set of bets through um, through champion bets today. Sapphire Miss uh, that won. Uh, again, it was five dollars when I advised it. I think it ended up paying uh, eight dollars fifty Betfair SP. Uh, vibrato at ten dollars, it ran third. Uh, it was just 0.35 each way, whereas that was 0.5 a win and one unit of place. Heavenly Dame was sixty-one dollars and eleven dollars. That price is just the third best price, by the way. Uh, it was actually seventy-one dollars and I think sixteen dollars a place available. Uh, at, the, at that price, it was just 0 0.1 win and, and 0 0.3 units in place. Uh, that horse actually ran fourth, but so we're very stiff not to get a, a big uh, big collect for a very small outlay there. Um, and lucky members of the the, the uh, webinar can actually see who we are backing in the next two races at Lawn System and the last two betting races for the day there. But that's sort of the style. So you can see there's different staking, and the staking is based on confidence and value. Uh, so the bigger the value, the more I'll bet. Um, generally 0.5 win one unit of place is probably the, it's usually the maximum but you know if there's a real real high confidence it'll be sort of one by two um, or you know it, it sort of you might have 1.5 units of win um, which we did do for example on uh, uh, the winner of the Zipping Classic uh, the Taj Mahal um, but you know the, the staking is, is done in, in that manner to, to balance uh, the, the risk reward essentially Sorry, mate, I wasn't concentrating. I'm just backing GG Trendsetter and Liffy Bow. Um, <laughs> mate, I've got another question from, uh, again, all of the boys are coming out. Hello, Tarak. He says, Dean, if you feel value in such big odds, would you also suggest betting something on exotics as there could be a big prize there? Um, 
I've the, the service has no limits. So in the past we've done exotics and sometimes we do um, exactors, trifectors. Uh, you've again steered me into the next part of the the, the uh, presentation, which is something we don't do a lot anymore. But um, and I just sort of haven't found the same uh, you know value. But when when it comes up and really stands out to me is when we sort of take it. But we've got you know a Kalgoorlie Quaddy for example uh, that paid twenty thousand. So we invested one unit. We got a 68 unit collect. Uh, we got a Esperance quality at 28,000, 2.7 units invested on that for 72 unit collects. So we've had some big exotic wins, had a few big trifectas and that sort of thing. Um, for the most part, in trying to balance, I suppose the, the you know the variance and that sort of thing. Um, I haven't given out a lot of exotics, but for sure uh, there's a real opportunity for members to take the big priced horses and, and, and couple them in with, you know, especially those doing their own form analysis or their own, uh, you know, suggestions from, from elsewhere, then um, the opportunity is there. But it's, uh, you know, what I feel very strongly is an opportunity in the exotic space, I will advise it to members. Um, it's just not something that I do as often anymore. Robert says, uh, have you ever analysed whether the place betting is overall profitable or not? And if so, how does it compare to the straight win betting? Um, yes, I have. And it um, is about the same, which is why we do it. Uh, pretty similar sort of profit levels and POT on the whole. Um, I'm always tinkering and revising things to, to, to do it. But um, that's what I found, the, the place betting... Is profitable. Um, that's why we do it. But it also, I think, it helps to smooth the variance a bit as well. You know, if you get a few unlucky beats, spin by nose, um, bad rise, that sort of thing. But you know, you can still, you can still get something out of the the place bet. Um, I definitely prefer them more at these sort of horses. You know, the odds are eleven dollars, sixteen dollars a place, that sort of thing. Um, because then, you know, you can identify a big belly runner and. You know, it might get knocked off by the favourite or, or something, but you still get a real big collect from a small investment. So uh, the one by three generally is sort of worked. Um, but then, you know, if I'm back in multiple horses, it'll often just be a win on, on either. Um, and sometimes when for various reasons I'm, I'm not as confident and I'm, I might just go each way or, or just win only, uh, it, it really, it's really just the, the uh, you know, assessment of the, the risk. Um, and the, the confidence and the value obtaining that that uh, um, you know governs the staking. That's it for questions, mate. Um, yeah, what else have you? Uh, would you yeah, like I'll to just, finish uh, off with? Just a, just a couple more minutes. I'll just show a couple more tactics for finding winners for people. SP profiling is one. This was a five horse field. You can go through them quite quickly. You know, start from the bottom. Um, this horse had um, only had two starts. So purple means it starts since that race because uh, we're in a sort of database. It's going backwards. But you know, it run eighth and, and tenth, went a long way. Didn't look like it was much good. Unscopable was the horse that um, had been beaten two and a half lengths its last two starts at Morfittville over 1,000 metres. Interestingly, it SP'd around $12. So it wasn't hugely, there was no huge confidence about the horse in either of those races. This horse had run third. Uh, in a Morfittville maiden at seven dollars fifty, um, you know, beaten two lengths, so okay. But they're all sort of maiden class. And then this horse, Danger Dealer, was a dollar forty. Um, again, you know, it had been beaten two point six lengths, uh, similar to Run Scopable at seventeen dollars. Then Run Second at beaten one point seven lengths at four dollars thirty. It had run a good race in a two hundred k race, and I think that's why it was such short odds. But you know, going to the detail of it, there, there was nothing enormously special about the quality of the horses um, all the time. So um, it, it wasn't outstanding. The, the horse that was of some interest was this horse. Uh, from the David Hayes stable, yeah, they thought enough of it to run it in Melbourne twice. Firstly, in a listed race, where it did SP $12 and um, in, in what did turn out to be a, a handy race. Um, it then had a break and ran at Mooney Valley in a 50k race after being gelded. Um, it was five dollars, and it got beaten. And, and the thing, by third lengths, and, and, and you know, one sort of thing I do generally is it's actually quite rare for horses to get beaten more than about eight to ten lengths, um, unless they just really can't pick their feet up. But 
um, you know, certainly if they're in the market in a handy race from a handy stable, they're just they're only going to get beaten that way if there's something wrong with them. And you can see, uh, you know, again the the stewards report tells me that there was a poor recovery, so there's an excuse for that run. It was backed at five dollars, and this sort of SP profiling, you know, it's taking on uh, maidens essentially from you know uh, from South Australia, and uh, we're talking about a, a you know horse from Melbourne that the, the Hayes Stable obviously thought could win. Um, you know, not even a maiden race, but a, a Nar Zero race uh, as sort of the, the second favourite. Um, and the only reason it got beat was, uh, you know, there was obviously something it might have choked down or, you know, some, something went wrong with it. But again, um, you know, they brought it to Adelaide um, in a far, far weaker race and suddenly you're getting sort of $13, I think it was there, uh, SP, I think it was $16 on Betfair. Uh, and so it's just an example of SP profiling where if you, um, you, you can use that on, on, especially on younger horses, but just to assess their true ability compared to what they've shown on the track. Uh, and, and people have a tendency, because some of are saying if we give one run, I find people often then won't forgive two bad runs, but if there's genuine reasons for them um, and uh, and everything else is telling you that the horse is a lot better than, than what it's shown, then um, you, know, you can forgive multiple runs. And I think this webinar has shown plenty of examples of why. Um, and highly geared, I'll just quickly, you know, it's sort of back to back. And, you know, one thing I look for um, is horses who've won the same race um, in a previous, uh, in, in the past year. You know, so this horse um, had won the same race last year. Uh, and it's a real good tactic that, again, anyone can use um, to find, uh, you know, really good winners. And this one at, at $10. Um, you know, horses are creatures of habit. Uh, it's one thing to, to win a um, race over the same track and distance. Um, but when they've actually won the exact same previous race, you can see, again, it was an open handicap, same sort of prize money at the same time uh, last year. So I just find often those horses, you know, they're creatures of habit. They also, you, you hear about spring horses and autumn horses, and there's horses that do run well at different times. It's quite interesting in New Zealand, one of the, the parts in the form is actually whether a horse is won within the, the two to three week period corresponding period last year um, which kind of denotes that horses do actually have a tendency to uh, race well at a certain time of the year they might be spring horses or autumn horses i've noticed in australia that no form guide includes that information it's quite interesting that they don't but um it's something that i found is uh, you know really useful uh, again to, to see when a horse might be coming right in the coast and, and coming right um, for themselves. Uh, just lastly, these are the, the quaddy pictures, uh, the quaddy results, but I'll just show you, you know, the power of Betfair is the last thing. MD official price was $101, was $430 to $560 in the last minute, five minutes in Betfair. Betfair SP, $260. Time and Truth, official $23. Betfair SP at $80 and $140 available. Fish Bones Fry, again, officially $34. SP on Betfair was $60. Chazzy Lee, $56 versus $104. Kaiser France, $71 versus $130. Betfair SP. So, uh, you know, I do, I do encourage people to use... Um, bit fair and, and try to learn that because it's uh you know very uh very beneficial so i've gone over time i apologize for that but hopefully everyone got something out of it um and that's it for me unless anybody uh has any questions we do have a late question how much do you think you can take on a winner from a single betfair sp bet uh What's he saying? What's he asking? How much you can have on it? How much do you think you can take on a winner? This is from Robert from a single Betfair SP bet. No. I don't actually understand the question. Take on a winner. No, Robert, if Robert, if you want to clarify that question, uh, flick it through again. A lot of comments, mate, are very informative. I notice in Trial Spy that you often advise to place wages double that of when, uh, double that of the win bets. Fields less than eight starters do not seem to deter. Can you advise your reasoning behind this, Paul? Uh, double the place bets? Yes. Um, well, I think that's sort of what I was talking about with the yeah, yep. one by two or the, the one by three. Um, you know, the, the one by three sort of the, you know, as an example here for the roughies, just is about really getting a, a big, um, 
uh, you know, return even if even if they just run a place. Uh, so you do the you do the hard form analysis, and I just find backing them to win only um, when they can run none lucky second or or you know good third, um, and you're not getting something out of it. It's proven very beneficial to use that. This is really you know essentially often aiming just to break even if the run horse runs second or third, and it's usually on the the high confidence horses. Right, I really think they're a pretty strong chance of, of running a place, um, and if they do. Uh, you know, you, you, you make a small profit or uh, you break even. Um, and if they win, you, you get the cream of the win, uh, plus a little bit on the on the place bit and it sort of works out. And just a lot of the detailed analysis I did showed that that was uh, a far smoother run in terms of variance and, um, uh, and, and more profitable than just betting win only. Uh, it was profitable on its own, the place betting. So that's, that's why I, I choose that tack. Beautiful. Robert was referring to how deep the pools are on Betfair SP, I think is what you will find. The, um, the pools are surprisingly deep. It's obviously more on Metro than, um, than say, country, but uh, you know, the, um, the, the SP is sort of generated on algorithm of who's laying and who's betting. Um, and I think you'll find often with these big price horses that people are prepared to lay plenty because they just don't think the horse is in chance. And there's a lot of layers who just who do that, um, or they're you know balancing their books and you know bookies are balancing their books and all sorts of people are balancing things at the end. So um, you know I think you'd be surprised how much you can have, but I, I don't have the answer in terms of how the algorithm works and, and how much you have to bet before you might impact it. Um, but it's probably you know, if you're talking about wanting to bet uh, what, you know, some members bet $1,000 a unit, $500 a unit, that's probably something I would investigate with um, your bet fair, but I ha haven't found any issue with it. Um, and I think if there was an issue with it, we wouldn't have examples like Fishbones Fry and a Strathalbyn Maiden and Time and Truth and a Bunbury Maiden, seeing as I advise people to bet, bet fair SP and MD and a Toowoomba Maiden. So, uh, so, you know, my answer is I've been running you know, the service for six years. We've got a pretty strong member base. They they have, you know, grow on their unit size substantially over the journey. Um, and they're all getting on. We're still getting this bit for SP prices. So I think, I think my answer to you is you won't have any issue. Dean, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time tonight. A lot of guys are, are flicking comments through saying uh, thank you very much for the information, learned heaps and uh, stuff like that. So, Dean, again, thank you for your time tonight. No worries. No worries at all. Guys, if you are thinking about taking on Dean's winners, you've seen um, that this guy has been doing it for a very long time. It's sustainable, uh, profitable growth over six years. Um, if you've got any questions at all in regards to the memberships, please get in touch, 1300 500 057, or you can email us, team at Um I've learnt heaps. I hope the guys out there that tuned in tonight learned a lot too. And the winner of our one month free of Dean's winning service is Mr. A. Wichello. So I will be in contact with you tomorrow. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and thank you, Dean, again. No worries. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Cheers.